Well, welcome everybody on this cold, miserable, dank day. But we have to look forward to the warmth of collegiality, uh, conversation and cogent thinking. But before I introduce Pittman Potter, who of course you all know well, I'd like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So I've said I, I feel most fortunate to introduce yet another very eminent colleague, the uh, HSB Chair in uh, Asian Research and still on the faculty of the Allard School of Law, Pittman Potter, of course, who's published a series um, of very interesting and significant books. And I'm just going to give you the titles of four more recent ones, Law and Policy on China's Periphery, Selective Adaptation and Institutional Capacity by Routledge, that is to say in 2011, The Legal System of the People's Republic of China, published by Polity Press in 2013, uh, then Assessing Treaty Performance in China, 2014 by UBC, and now, and I'm sure this will come more into our conversation, just published by UBC in 2021, Exporting Virtue, China's International Human Rights Activism in the Age of Xi Jinping. Um, and of course, you will know that it was Pittman Potter who brought to UBC campus the Dalai Lama in 2004, and perhaps even also know that uh, he is an ordained minister of the Anglican Church of Canada. And there, I suppose I should say, if Pittman will allow me, that we have uh, um, a uh, experience in common. We both went to cathedral schools, but I was rejected by the organist and choir master as having a lousy voice, but Pittman was not. So Pittman, maybe we could begin your very interesting life journey. Um, I think you can almost say from Robert Frost's garden uh, to Vancouver, via many locations, including Egypt, Seattle, and Beijing. Over to you. Well, good morning, or afternoon, I should say, and uh, thanks very much uh, to the Emeritus College, and especially to uh, Graham and Rodri for making all this possible, so I appreciate that. Um, Rodri's reference to Robert Frost's garden is simply uh, an acknowledgement that I actually lived on Robert Frost's farm for several years when I was very young. Um, and I, to be honest, family lore being what it is, I was never quite sure which came first, but he was a family friend and my uncle, James Potter, uh, wrote a book about him um, many, many years ago and so on. So anyway, uh, Robert Frost loomed large in my youthful upbringing. But um, anyway, I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I was a choir boy at the Washington Cathedral and uh, was at the cathedral school. And uh and then I was an acolyte there. So I was steeped in the Anglican tradition from an early age. Um, and then uh, did my uh, undergraduate in, in DC at George Washington in Chinese history, and then uh, came out to the University of Washington to do a doctorate in political science focusing on China, and also did a law degree and the rest of it sort of rolls together. So, so essentially uh, after my degrees and so on, I took a job fairly early on uh, with a major international law firm in Beijing. And uh, this uh, latter day, I mean, uh, this was the uh, uh, Graham and James Beijing office and uh, another large international firm. And, you know, it was just um, an interesting way of actually testing some of the things that I had already been writing about, because my doctoral dissertation was on contract law in China. And essentially, my approach was a politics and law approach, which is, of course, in China, zheng fa is uh, the combining of politics and law is still part of the standard vocabulary. So, so the, the contract law uh, uh, dissertation, which was later published by the University of Washington Press, um, really focused on the tension between what's in the text and what's in the social and economic reality. So it was really a, an effort to try to you know, understand how the texts both reflected political and ideological positions of the regime, but also issues about performance and practice. And so when I got to uh, Beijing and was uh, heading up the uh, 
the Graham and James office. And that was another incredible opportunity in the sense that in, in Beijing, I mean, I was running the office of a large law firm in Beijing. Uh, our clients were the top 20, 30 corporate clients of the world, because that's all who was doing business in China in those days. And here I was, uh, you know, I, I don't remember if I was 30 yet. I think it was in my late, my late 20s. <clears throat> excuse me, um, sort of having incredible opportunities to do things uh, because of the China um, thing. So anyway, I um, became steeped in, in business law. I taught business law at Beida um, uh, for three years, uh, six, uh, so 86, uh, 87, 88, 89. And my, it's interesting that, uh, you know, Tiananmen, I was there. I know Diana was and other people were as well in Beijing at that time. Um, I was teaching at Peking University as well as doing my law work. And, um, and I, my last class was on, I, I remember clearly, uh, my last class was on the Thursday before the weekend of June 4th. And on that Thursday, my class usually had 25 or so people in it. It was a, it was a seminar discussion group. A class, I mean, full credit and whatnot, but nonetheless, and virtually everybody in the class was gone. I think there were only three people there. And I had great attendance all year, but there were three people there. And everybody else had gone home because, you know, that's what happened with many of the students is they actually left Beijing before the violence actually started. And a lot of the violence at Tiananmen uh, was directed not so much at, uh, at, at the students as much as it was city dwellers and others who had gotten caught up in the uh, in the protests and also uh, people who had come from the countryside because many people in China had students and others had come to Beijing from the other parts in China to be part of this great movement. But regrettably, by the time they arrived, it was nearly faded out and they met the brunt of the party's uh, ire. And, uh, and I, I'm sure I'm still recovering from that experience. I mean, I my apartment was right on Chang'anjia, so I saw the tanks and I saw people getting run over and all the rest of that. It was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but in any event, my, my experience in China and, and the, gave me a chance to test some contract stuff. And, and one thing that came through to me was, again, the difference between the text and the reality. So I was in a negotiation with the landlords of a very large office building uh, in, uh, in China, in Beijing. And the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the landlord, the, uh, a state-owned Chinese company with a joint venture with a foreign firm, but the Chinese side of that uh, uh, joint venture had uh, had extended the leases and changed the terms of the leases without notifying the tenants. And mm -hmm. under Chinese contract law at the time, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to get the permission of the other party before you change the contract terms. And so I was in a negotiation with the uh, this. Uh, official about how that could happen. And I was came to quip, I had the statute and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and I, and he said, Oh, but you don't understand. As the um, dominant official related to the permissions of all the offices that are in those foreign offices in that building that were tenants of the building as the official that approved them, I have the authority to speak for them in terms of contract changes. And I am not it, regardless of whether I actually inform them or not. And uh, so here is an example of how the practical reality, the political background and so on uh, are ones that you really have to be aware of and dig and dig out because they're not immediately obvious. But in any event, what that led me to that many other experiences during that period uh, had a big effect on my China law analysis. So uh, first of all, the, I wrote about this very early on in a China quarterly piece uh, called Riding the Tiger, which amazingly to me is still cited and referenced and whatnot, but I refer to the formalism and institution, uh, formalism and instrumentalism in the Chinese legal regime. The formalism being articulating laws that depict a reality as if that were reality. Uh, and the instrumentalism where the law is essentially used as an instrument of rule by the government, it's not, an, uh, it's not a restraint on government. And part of the difficulty here is, a, is the use of the word law. And so when we are in Canada and we think about what law means, people have a you know, essentially a Canadian legal culture understanding of what law means or ought to mean, even if they're not trained in law and so on. They have a general sense of it as a restraint on government action or restraint even on social action. And But in China, it's a completely different story and law is just an instrument of, of governance. So it creates all kinds of different issues. And also my time in China really alerted me to the uh, tension between text and practice. And that probably has informed all of my scholarship uh, uh, since then. And then finally, uh, and taking a note from one of my mentors in graduate school, the great Dan Lev, who was one of the great uh, both um, uh, social, political, um, uh, liberal 
reformers, but also a terrific scholar on Indonesia. And he pointed me in the direction of legal culture, which I've never really looked back. And, and so those have all those have been the features of formalism, instrumentalism, text and practice, and legal culture have kind of informed my uh, writing about China really since then. So lo and behold, I come back from China and I end up uh, up at UBC. Yes, Roderick, please. No, I was just going to say, um, talk some more about your understanding of law, because we we did discuss earlier, didn't we, the, the extent to which the law is, how should we say, flexible under pressure from certain um, interests and the like, but it still remains, as you said, some kind of form of control uh, of excess. So uh, thank you for that. And, and one of the... Uh... One of the themes that I talk about repeatedly in my writing is the relationship between law and legitimacy. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, one of my uh, dissertation advisors uh, was a, uh, a specialist in, uh, in Max Weber and was the um, co-editor translator of one of uh, Weber's uh, uh, major uh, contributions on law and society. Um, and so um, it, uh, I, I was just sort of steeped in that tradition. And uh, so I thought a lot about law and legitimacy. And of course, Weber was very interested in the legitimacy of law itself, as well as the legitimacy that it conveyed through legal, uh, uh, rationa uh, legal rationality. So uh, part of the question is, there's the functioning of law. And we have, you know, one of the first cases you read in contracts, first year contracts, is a case of a, of a mining company that gets an agreement from a farming, I mean, from a farming family in Oklahoma, I think it was, and uh, to, to explore for minerals on their land. The mining company goes in, tears the land all up, doesn't find anything and leaves. And uh, the lawsuit was, well, they were supposed to restore the land to its original condition, but that was never in any of the contracts. And so you might think, well, that's an unjust result from a legal process. And that's indeed true. And that's the point to say that, you know, what's legal and what's just are not always the same. And, and so there are all, there's a whole schools and schools and reams and reams and volumes and volumes written on the tension between, between the legal order and justice and how law privileges the privileged. And, and for those who have access to uh, legal resources, they tend to do better than people that don't and so on and so forth. And, and all that's true. And so, you know, that's one of the dilemmas. But one of the other uh, issues that actually as a constraint on those who uh, abuse the uh, legal system, and this is one reason why they want to keep it all secret. So if whether you look at Donald Trump or the or the Panama Papers or any other example, uh, people who have the resources to use to bend the law to their own interests really don't want it to be known. And uh, even if it is not, strictly speaking, unlawful. And the reason for that is there's a very powerful legitimating force in law that people expect the law to do certain things. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the, of the great uh, phrase in, in, uh, in, in Oliver where, where the beetle says, well, if the law says that the law is an ass. Well, yeah. we all know the law is an ass most of the time. And that's, excuse my, excuse my, uh, my, 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 my language. And, uh, and so we uh, are constantly confronted with this question of legal texts, the sort of the, the jurisprudence underlying the legal text, the norms, the ideologies, and so on, on the one hand, and how it actually works in practice, and how it, it tends to, in creation, in legislation, tends to entrench privileged positions. But because politics in a liberal democratic society being what they are, it sometimes incorporates other interests as well. But you know, there are many, many examples, landlord tenants, a perfect example of this, where, where despite language in tenancy acts of protecting tenants and renters and whatnot, um, landlords still prevail in litigation most of the time because they're better resourced. So, so there are many examples in our society of the, of the dysfunction of law. But the problem is that laws, or not a problem, but the feature is law has a legitimating function both for the regime and for itself. And so that acts as a constraint on, on really obvious abuse. Now, I think you know, in the US we'll see what happens to Trump and see whether that's actually true or not. But anyway, uh, in China, <clears throat> people in China are actually quite, uh, um, uh, well, pretty cynical about the regime, I think it's fair to say, and, and, and so had very low expectations about law. And interestingly enough, when uh, there was a major law enacted in China, right around the time of Tiananmen uh, demonstrations, uh, the administrative uh, litigation law, which provided for judicial review of administrative action. And uh, I was doing a, wrote up an article on this and did some other work on it and whatnot. And I ended up having 
a, a pre-existing relationship with one of the drafters and so that helped things along and so on and so forth. And so after that law was passed, uh, the amount of litigation in which individual citizens sued administrative agencies for failure to give a license, for abusive fines, for corruption, whatever it is, uh, skyrocketed. But then what happened is the courts basically were siding with the government agency virtually all the time, and the frequency of that litigation just went back down to nothing. So uh, people in China often, in the early days and even today, see law in an instrumental way also. As the regime sees it as instrumental as part of rule, people see it as an instrument to achieve their socioeconomic and political goals. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of mythology about out there about China not being a litigious society, but that's been pretty well thoroughly um, disproven, not only in historical research about litigation in the in the in traditional China, but also uh, today that you know, uh, China is a very litigious place. And uh, mm -hmm. so but it's that instrumentalism that makes that true and the legitimating force of law that we pay attention to so much in the in outside of China is not as much of a restraint there. Yeah, well, can I can I sort of pick you up now on, on the, the very interesting title of your latest book, Exporting Virtue, because virtue carries so much with it. And will you allow me a really awful kind of uh, pun that uh, Jinping seems to have no pangs. So perhaps you could run with that a little bit. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, <laughs> so uh, the context of this book is, is actually builds on so much of other things that I've done. Now it's true that it, it, it came out of a series of articles, but it's, it's so different from the articles that really is, the, the, the whole is really quite more than some of the parts if I could dare to say that. But um, essentially most of, uh, or a lot of my work previously had been on how China responded to international legal developments. So after 1978, when the legal system started getting going again, China, Chinese officials, the Chinese government were very intent on essentially copying foreign models, including Taiwan models. So whether we look at the civil code or contract law or civil procedure, even those, those often are um, sometimes copied verbatim from foreign laws. And, uh, and that's uh, one of you know, a number of complications. So then the question becomes, how does China engage with the foreign? And this brings up a, uh, a long-term project that I've been working on, which is uh, at UBC, the, the judge training program, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the MCRI projects on selective adaptation and, and uh, coordinated compliance, um, and uh, even, the, even the peripheries project were really about how China engages with and adapts and changes those international standards. But it's a sort of a, in China, they use the term T in Jung, which is to Jung, to use the foreign, but preserve the T, preserve the essence of Chinese culture. And this was, as I discuss in the current book, a, uh, uh, there are examples of this in the late 19th century uh, reform period under the Qing, uh, in the early 20th century uh, Republic of China, uh, May 4th movement and so on, where, where efforts to borrow foreign technologies, whether they be engineering and military science or whether they be education and administration, were stymied essentially by traditionalists who said these will threaten unduly our uh, existing values and norms. And so, um, so, so the Chinese legal system has actually carried out that, that same issue, which is where on contract law, for example, which I continue to continued to follow for a long time. They, they entrenched the principle of party autonomy, that the autonomy of the party, the freedom of the parties to reach the agreement. And that's embedded in Western contract law. But by the time it got into China, it was not quite in the same form because the freedom to uh, enter into contracts was constrained by all sorts of political and regulatory constraints by which the government maintained its interests despite people running around and doing contracts freely with each other, at least apparently. So there's that, there's that dynamic of the foreign and the local. So what I deal with in this current book is it's really from, uh, from the outside in perspective to an inside out perspective. And I hasten to add that my, my previous book on treaty performance in China, the 214 volume, that uh, developed a, a model or a paradigm of what I called selective adaptation, which had an analytical framework that was somewhat complicated, but nonetheless described how Chinese officials, uh, I, uh, decision makers, uh, interpretive communities, if you will, 
uh, interpreted foreign rules based on their own circumstances. So for example, when China signed on to the World Trade Organization or any, another, any of a number of other international treaties, they are nominally bound to the text of that organization, of that treaty, WTO or whatever else. But when they're interpreting it, they're interpreting that text in terms of local meaning and local knowledge. And so it's not quite the uh, submissive uh, Western initiative Chinese response approach that was associated with a lot of Orientalist Chinese uh, studies in the late 19th and early 20th century. It really does draw on the legal culture as an autonomous and powerful force through which decision makers in China, legal communities and so on, interpret a wide range of norms, including their own. So, um, so in the current book, um, we have seen in the last um, uh, 10 years, pretty much, but maybe six or eight years, a, a increased effort by China to actually change the international order. So as opposed to selective adaptation where international standards were being brought in but reinterpreted, um, what we see now is a much more active effort to actually change those international standards. And uh, this was referred to obliquely by Hu Jintao in his final uh, speech uh, in his last, as, as, as he was about to retire as uh, party chair in, in, uh, in, um, at the 18th Party Congress. And it was reiterated by Xi Jinping and been reiterated by Xi Jinping late, uh, since then, where uh, China should be changing from being a norm taker to being a norm shaper. And, uh, and Xi Jinping used the specific term shaping international standards and so on. So, so there's very much of a, uh, an effort to do that. Now, you know, if you look at the title of this book, you might not know. I mean, if you didn't know me and you looked at the title of this book, you might think it said something other than it does because uh, it, the title is actually uh, Exporting Virtue, uh, China's International Human Rights Activism in the Age of Xi Jinping. So um, uh, clearly most people think of international human rights activism as uh, the great work of Amnesty International and human rights uh, in China and those folks, which I applaud and have participated in and think is terrific. Uh, China's international uh, human rights activism is quite a dis different sort. It's about trying to change the norms, standards, uh, processes for international human rights law. Um, but it's still activism, it's still international, and it still concerns human rights. So there is a, you know, there's a, a rather heavy handed level of irony, excuse me, in that title. But I also did that somewhat deliberately, because I'm hoping that the title will escape whatever restrictions are placed on books of this nature going to China and elsewhere. Um, because uh, most of the time, my experience at least, is the people who are reading the mail and reading the articles and reading things to decide whether they should crack down on them or not often don't go very far into them. They often just look at the title and check, check the subheads, kind of like a poor undergraduate student, and, uh, and then they make their decision as to whether to censor the item or not. And, and one a good example of that is last week I gave a talk to several hundred uh, people through Hong Kong University Law School about this book. And it was a, very surprising to me that the authorities in Hong Kong, as we all know, are very much cracking down on anything that's critical, remotely critical of China, let alone other things, permitted this to happen and actually permitted the book to come in. And, and Hong Kong was, uh, the, the librarian was uh, very proud of being able to acquire it and put it in their library. And I don't know if the misuse of international human rights activism deliberately by me and the title played a role there, but uh, I guess it can't hurt. In any event, um, uh, what the book really about is about create, uh, explaining the uh, normative foundation for Chinese human rights law, <laughs> which I refer to as, as essentially state-led uh, uh, state development, and then looking at its fundamental precepts, which are party control, uh, conditionality of rights, and stability for development. And then I explain how those are prevalent in China's, uh, the Chinese regime's treatment of political expression, uh, international trade and investment, and uh, various uh, specific issues like labor law, environmental law, and so on. And uh, so that's what the book is essentially about. And it really makes the case, I think, uh, that I hope at least, uh, that China has been very, very active at the UN and elsewhere in trying to actually change the procedures and the standards for human rights law. And why are they doing that? That's the question that people ask me all the time. Why do they care? I mean, why does China care what the international law on human rights says? Because they don't seem to want to follow it very often. So why do they care about it? And the answer is back to that question of legitimacy. Human rights, as, as most of us will, will, rem will remember, 
does not only involve civil and political rights, but it involves a whole host of economic, social, and cultural rights. And in fact, human rights affect the entire panoply of socioeconomic uh, relations in any society. And China has, China's leg, the regime's legitimation strategy has moved from the historical uh, traditional legitimation that Weber talked about, because uh, you know, without the Communist Party, there would be no new China, that sort of thing, um, because there is such unrest and lack of knowledge and agreement on what China's past actually is that that has not been quite as effective. The rational legal uh, basis for legitimacy is also falling apart as the regime often ignores its own rules in the pursuit of its critics. And thirdly, the charismatic uh, leadership uh, element of legitimacy that uh, may have been true with Mao, but it's certainly uh, many would dispute whether it's true with Xi Jinping or not, is also weak. And so they have to, you know, they're, they're moving toward a performance legitimacy approach. We are raising life standards. We are raising incomes. We are making people's lives better. But the question becomes, what are the standards for that? Uh, the, the current common prosperity uh, theme of, of Xi Jinping, which obviously happened after the book, but the, the discussion had been there, is about reducing inequality and improving people's lives and so on. And, and the question is, what are the standards for that? So if the standards that China is being called to use to assess its panoply of socioeconomic, political, uh, environmental, um, intellectual, cultural policies are being assessed in terms of this lingering uh, realm of human rights standards from abroad, China is not going to end up looking too good. The regime's performance is going to be found wanting. And so the regime is bent on changing those international standards by which ironically and paradoxically, its domestic performance is often compared, not only by foreigners, but also by the politically aware, globalized, increasingly globalized uh, populace in China, uh, not all of whom are uh, reveling in their fifth Mercedes and very happy to uh, shout out uh, Xi Jinping once away. Um, no, so so that's it. essentially what that, that new book is really about. It's really from a T and, and what the, the fi final point I'll make is that we have gone from a T. Jung environment in which the Chinese legal system is Jung, is using international standards, but adjusting them to meet the preservation of the local system, the T. And now what's happening is China is presenting the world another T. Jung uh, experience because the world has got to deal with China. Mm -hmm. And our experience with COVID and, and, uh, and climate just recently are two good examples of number one, China's alienation from the world system, and two, the absolute desperate need the whole world has for China to get on board with responsible uh, policies with regard to both pandemic response and, uh, and, uh, and, and climate change. So uh, how, understanding how this interaction, this kind of love-hate relationship. You know, in the peripheries book, I mentioned China's peripheries as kind of a fear and loathing approach to uh, uh, foreign minorities. And that's also with regard to uh, the foreign system as well, as there's a certain level of fear and anxiety, but there's also a certain level of dismissal to the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the um, recent uh, uh, work uh, of, uh, of uh, Huning, Wang Huning uh, in Shanghai, which has uh, uh, challenged uh, the applicability of liberal standards in China is just one example, and uh, there are many others. Well, I was just going to lead you on, actually, in that direction, because the, the book and other of your work has really discussed, looked at populism in other parts of the world. Uh, and we together talked, uh, I, I find it very interesting, about uh, the larger picture of globalization and the emergence of disparities rather than the hopes that were originally held out for that idea. So maybe you could follow up particularly on populism because I think you've written some very interesting things about that phenomenon and its complexities. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for that. And, um, you know, early on at, um, I think of my UBC time as the first 10 years were at the law school, the second 10 years at the Institute of Asian Research, and the third 10 years back at the law school, uh, which is not too inaccurate. So in the, in the uh, uh, fairly soon after I, I, I joined IAR in 99 or 2000, I did a major uh, strategic uh, grant from Shirk on globalization and social cohesion in Asia. And that was a multi-country study, including China, Japan, Korea, uh, and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, I'm 
think I'm not uh, forgetting anything, um, about the impact of globalization on social cohesion. And, and so that was a very interesting project, which involved uh, several publications and books and stuff that came out of it. And so that's been an ongoing issue. Uh, the current work that I'm on, and I, uh, even though I'm sometimes asked to give a talk about the exporting virtue book and so on and so forth, I mean, that, as far as I'm concerned, I, I sort of did that. So I'm, you know, I, I, talking about it's fine, but I'd much rather talk about what I'm working on now. And that's uh, this, uh, this um, uh, populism question. So, so what I'm uh, suggesting in this new work, and it's, it's still just a, um, it's a manuscript that I'm working on, got a couple of chapters done, um, is to look at a phenomenon of what I call globalized populism, to understand China, the Chinese government's behavior and, and, and interaction with the world in terms of discourses of populism. So what this uh, invited me to do was to do a whole lot of learning about populism and, uh, and so on. And so I developed a, a kind of an approach which uh, uh, accepts that Populism has both uh, what I call a progressive and regressive dimensions, but left wing and right wing populism, you know, left wing, you might think of, uh, you might think of Extinction Rebellion or uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or any number of other uh, examples, uh, I don't know more, so on. And, and those are basically imagining an ideal future and trying to get to that ideal future and seeing elites and vested interests as an obstacle to achieving those, that future ideal. Um, and so I call that progressive populism. Others would call it left-wing po populism. I call it progressive because it's about progress toward a future ideal. Uh, what uh, many people often refer to as right-wing populism, I, I refer to as regressive populism because it's, because it's about recapturing a past ideal. Now, both of these ideals may be equally mythical, but nonetheless, uh, right-wing populism is about recapturing that past ideal, make America great again. So, so, so the question then becomes, uh, if we look around the world, we see uh, left-wing and right-wing populist regimes. And I do a bit of a survey on five of these in the second chapter of this book, um, trying to select from left and right po uh, populism. So I look at Latin America and look at Venezuela and Brazil as left and or progressive and regressive populism. In Europe, I look at Hungary and the Greek regime under Alexis Tsipras, which was a left-wing populist regime, and Hungary, of course, under Orban is more right-wing. And then I look at India uh, under Modi, which is uh, by most accounts a right-wing populist regime uh, or regressive, shall we say. And then I sort of say, well, you know, China would have been the analog to the left-wing populist regime under Mao. And China has, the Chinese Communist Party has portrayed itself in populist terms since its beginning. And the rhetoric of serve the people and so on has, has really called on, on populism. But in the current China, um, the last populist uh, that made any headlines was uh, was Bo Xilai, and we all know what happened to him. I mean, the, the current regime of Xi Jinping has no time for domestic populists, but nonetheless, it has used populist rhetoric to uh, challenge the international order and to present itself as an aggrieved uh, victim of the international order. And we saw that in its language on COVID uh, and the investigations on COVID, their response to questions about COVID origins and the call for more WHO investigations. We saw it in, in Xi Jinping's speech at the, uh, at the anniversary uh, party anniversary uh, celebrations last fall. And we're seeing it with respect to uh, uh, the Chinese uh, affiliation with the global South on the, uh, on the, uh, on the climate change uh, matter. So, so there are a number of examples where China has adopted essentially populist rhetoric to, to portray the rule-based international order as an unaccountable elite, which is oppressing China and other uh, vulnerable states. And that is a powerful uh, metaphor for them to use, both in terms of gaining domestic popularity, but also in essentially raising the obstacles to international cooperation, because it's no longer simply about national interest and cooperating on things of national interest. It's about recognition. It's about acceptance. It's about legitimation. It's about respect. And, uh, and so when uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, uh, told uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, climate envoy John Kerry that uh, cooperation on climate was impossible unless the U.S. and China resolved their other issues on things like human rights and the, the, the genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the takeover of Hong Kong and so on and so forth, that, that no progress on climate was possible unless the U.S. acceded to China's positions on these other matters. And, and that is no longer a matter of well, our mutual interests, 
I referred this I referred to this as a situational result or approach to China in a paper I did for uh, the Canadian government. Um, it's a, it's a, instead of it being a situational approach where countries can say Canada and China, for example, we agree uh, that climate change is a, pro is a crisis. So let us come together and figure ways to deal with this issue because it's in both of our interests. But after the Meng Wanzhou affair, um, China's willingness to put those kinds of issues aside and concentrate purely on its, on its uh, domestic, on its, uh, its self-interest in cooperation has, has weakened. Now, now, part of this is just simply a negotiating stance and, and being difficult, but, but part of it, I think, does reflect this genuine sense of, 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 of being uh, uh, aggrieved. Uh, the, the, and, and many have written about the culture of grievance uh, that, that is being promoted by the Chinese Communist Party and has been for many years. And, and that fits into this, uh, this populist uh, element. So, so the book essentially, the first chapter is my theory about populism and a fairly lengthy discussion of that uh, and how it, uh, I, I look at populism in terms of as it applies to three different uh, themes, accountability, the political side, uh, uh, prosperity, the economic side, and community, the social side. Now, I realize it's kind of clumsy categories, but nonetheless, I think they're useful to look at China's response to world crises on COVID, accountability, on climate, prosperity, and on refugee migration, or in China's case, migration generally, and particularly internal migration with regard, regard to community. So the way the book's organized, I set all that up in the first chapter. Second chapter, I do the five benchmark regimes, which I mentioned before. And then uh, the next three chapters are on COVID, which is done, or more or less, uh, climate, which is very close to done, and then community, which I hope to have uh, in, um, in uh, presentable form by probably February or March. And uh, that's and 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 the the ultimate question then becomes how do we assess China's globalized populism? Is it populism of a progressive sort that is moving toward a an, uh, an ideal? And if we look at the four cardinal principles that animate Chinese uh, party ideology, one of them is the socialist road, and with the Marxist approach, that means a process of socialism to communism. It's achieving a an inner, a, a, a future ideal. So that would suggest a progressive populism. But if you look at much of the action of the current regime in terms of uh, extolling the past and, and recapturing both Mao, but also you know, Chen Lung and a few others, um, we see also a very uh, regressive element there. But then you can also look at the way uh, accountability is addressed, the way that prosperity is addressed, and the way that community is addressed with respect to these three major global crises. And we see that China is kind of a hybrid. It can no longer be classified simply as a left-wing progressive uh, populist regime, but it's got some social e equity and, and justice elements that do admit to that particular characterization, but also many, many elements that put it in the regressive populism uh, category. So. I guess in the end, what I am doing with this book is what I've been doing with every pretty much everything else I've written is to try to understand what it is we're dealing with over there. Um, I uh, try to understand Chinese legal behavior, political behavior, social behavior, and, and in understanding that, you've got history, you've got ideology, you've got culture, you've got institutions, all of these factors. And I think it's really important for foreigners who are engaging in China to never think that we got it that we understand it all that we're all we know we should all be on this you know lifetime or multiple lifetime uh, uh, project of trying to understand what's going on over there because the more we understand it the, the less we will be disappointed in outcomes and the more we'll be able to engage kind of effectively so I'm giving a talk at the East West Center next uh, week I'll, I'll be here but They'll be there and and uh, a video talk on on re-engaging China and I think the again the COVID and the uh, climate change experiences of uh, both COP26 and and before that and then of course COVID have shown a very alienated China that is uh, really wondering whether whether cooperation with the international system is really in its interests and we have an international system that is increasingly impatient with China. And uh, I think it's not, I, I'd be corrected by people who know more about this than I do, but the COP26 meetings uh, currently going on in Glasgow seem to me to be an exercise by the US, the UK and the EU to persuade developing economies like China and India to up their emission standards because uh, we can't get to 1.5 without it. 
And the inequities built into that and the historical abuses built into that and so on are obvious, but that seems to me to be what a, a big part of the COP26 is about. And China is responding in a fairly predictable way, which is to say, as a developing country, we feel badly done by, by that particular level of pressure. So, so I think the challenge for us going forward is how are we going to overcome our frustrations and find a way to deal with a China that is essential. We cannot deal with global pandemics and we cannot deal with climate change without China being on side. So the question is, how do we get them on side? And the first step is to try to, try to understand their motivations and their perspectives on the positions that they take. Now, I, the last point I'll make on this is it's so critically important to, uh, to uh, remember that we're not talking about the monolith here. I mean, there's a lot of diversity in China. So I'm mainly talking about formal regime decisions, but even those are often very diverse and fragmented. And in Chinese society, I mean, I think uh, people may have seen it just recently. There's a, there's a, um, a pop song going around nowadays uh, uh, called Bo Li Xin, uh, uh, fra Fragile. And, uh, and it's a critique of China being sort of overly fragile. And, and I have to say many of us in the China community have heard no, no shortage of uh, expressions like you're hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. And when we invited the Dalai Lama here in 2004, mm -hmm. I had a visit from the embassy and they said specifically, um, in fact, I got a letter from the ambassador who said, interestingly, he didn't say don't do it. He just said, be careful that you don't uh, uh, hurt the feelings of the Chinese people when you, uh, when you do this. And uh, so, so I think that fragility is, is evident. And, and even in China, it is now a source of some level of, uh, of uh, mock humor. Well, you make a good point, of course. I mean, a lot of the problems with India and China is that we expect to have things so cheap. So we get, oh, yeah. them, I mean, it's, we get a lot of to do the polluting. Yeah. Can, can I just get you to touch a little bit on because you've worked so much in, in global trade and commerce uh, about um, possibly the reform of the current level of globalization in the sense that it seems to be creating huge disparities of income. Uh, I have to say I'm not particularly sanguine about that circumstance. Um, I think that there are so many vested interests embedded in the international trading system and the international financial system that, uh, and, and much, of the, much of the inequality comes from the, um, you know, often we talk about the difference between formal equality and substantive inequality in legal regulation. And it's a, the back to the old statement when the law says, the law prohibits people from sleeping under bridges and you know, the law applies to everyone. But in fact, only a small percentage of impoverished and oppressed people actually do sleep under bridges. So that law is not objective. It's targeted at, at a, an oppressed uh, group of people. And when we think about international trade law, whether it's on subsidies or, or, uh, or, or anti-dumping, or if we look at uh, international labor organization standards on, on labor rights, if we look at environmental issues, uh, there is still a problem of the unequal impact of international regulatory measures and the often disregard of those inequalities. And one example, and I, uh, our colleague uh, Ashok uh, Kotwal, who, who led a book in one of my projects on, on, uh, on development in India, the point he has made and others as well, is that even if the champions of global trade liberalization point to rising incomes, the rising incomes have not nearly kept pace with the rise in inequality. So if a, if a poor peasant is now making three times what they made five years ago, uh, the peasant's landlord is making 10 times what they made five years ago. And so and until we start really confronting that, there's a lot of talk about it. There's mention of it at COP26. There's mention of it at virtually every international conference, but, but the hard action of changing the regulatory framework confronts many, many very powerful vested interests. And indeed, we see this actually in China. Um, if we read some of the uh, material related to Xi Jinping's latest policy initiative on, quote, common prosperity, um, the, the idea is really to try to distribute the benefits of China's staggering growth record more evenly, more broadly, more fairly. And even now, that is getting very strong pushback, not only from international investors, but also from economic interests within China. So um, part of the question, I think, and this is beyond what we were gonna talk about today, but I'll just 
ad lib a little bit, is that the, the difference, uh, the, the trouble with the inequality dilemma is, is essentially how do you measure equality in terms of, do you measure it in terms of the original position, everybody starts out alike and whatever they achieve is for their benefit, or do we look at the social contexts within which people are born. I mean, they say in Canada, you can tell the average income by reference to the area code. And we know from lots of social science research and people in this group are more knowledgeable than I, that, that the circumstances of someone's family, birth, origins, life have a huge impact on their ability to thrive in the capitalist economy. And so um, it's not so simple as to say, we are started in the same place and those who succeeded should be praised and those who failed should be uh, not done much for. Uh, I think we have to look at is the structural and the environmental conditions that affect life chances. And, and we see that in our daily lives all the time. And at the, in the, my church world, I've done a lot of work on the street with homeless people. And one of the things that I would commend everybody to do is the next time you have a chance, and many people do this already, and you're passing someone who's got their coffee cup out and is spare changing, whatever, Give them, a, give them a, a McDonald's food card and sit and chat with them for a minute. And, and when you do that, what we, and I'm sure many people here have already experienced this, but what you realize is actually so many of the people on the street are pretty much regular folks. They're human beings, just like the rest of us. They've had a bad, <laughs> they've had a bad hand. Most of them have come out of uh, situations of family violence. Uh, many of them have come out of uh, situations of mental illness. But you know, when you talk to them, it's, I think it's surprising how actually how normal they seem, and and that is something that's a remembrance for all of us that you know there but for the grace of God go I, and so I really do think that that my work on the street with with the church has has just reinforced a view that I've had for a long time is that where people end up in life depends a heck of a lot on where they began, and uh, and until we start to equalize those things, so. Um, we're still going to have trouble. So it's a, it's a, it is an ongoing dilemma, and uh, I, I spend quite a bit of time in the current book on uh, uh, the populism book talking about the implications of populism for equality, uh, because in some uh, the 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 idea of being proactive to change the conditions that generate inequality is generally associated with progressive populism and the maintaining the systems of inequality and disregarding their impacts and, or at least uh, trying to find band-aid solutions rather than structural solutions is more characteristic of regressive populism. And so there's a fair amount of uh, discussion about the inequalities intended, uh, attended to that. And of course they play a role in COVID and they play a role in climate change and they play a role in refugee migration. Well, can I get you to talk a little bit more about what the neighborhood ministry does? I, mean, I do know something about it. Um, and I, I think it's a very clear indication that for you, faith is about dynamic action, not just about, to use uh, a different word, worship. Right. And I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I accept that they go together, but I've been more on the, uh, on the living out an active part of it. Uh, um, to, to just uh, uh, remember something I learned in, in, in seminary, where I, I went to divinity school, <laughs> among the other things I was doing as a, as a professor at UBC. And, uh, and one of my professors said, if there's one book in the Bible that you read, it should be the book of James. Uh, because the book of James says, faith without works is dead. And the book of James uh, talks about, if you, uh, if you see a, a, a fellow, who is cold, and you say, be well, have a nice day. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but be well, have a nice day. What does that actually do? Nothing. If you have to give the person a coat, you have to give the person food. You have to make the person whole in terms of those things the person needs before you pat them on the back and say, be well, have a nice day. So the action is just critically important. And it's a, you know, it's a faith action. So, so about, uh, oh, 14 years ago, uh, right when I uh, finished my degree, um, I did an MDiv at the Vancouver School of Theology, much to be recommended, I would say to all. Um, I, uh, I got together with a couple of other classmates and started talking about a, a street ministry in West Point Gray. Now there was a street ministry already downtown led by the Reverend Matthew Johnson yes. um, out, of, uh, out of St. James downtown. Mm -hmm. 
but and I and I had been aware growing up. I remember when the Martin Luther King riots happened. So I had the privilege of actually meeting Martin Luther King when I was at St. Albans, and 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 he gave his final sermon at a Washington Cathedral before he was assassinated. And after he was assassinated, as many people know, it was heartbreaking for many of us and just de totally devastating. But um, there were riots everywhere, but in DC in particular. So I took my little red wagon. I was in what, I guess I was in ninth grade by then. I took my little red wagon. I ran around in the neighborhood and collected food to take to a uh, church downtown that was giving food out to people whose houses had been burned down. And I have to say that that was a tremendously rewarding experience for me to, to be able to do that. And it took many, many, I mean, I filled many, many red wagons full of this stuff, took it all down there. But, um, but I was surprised at how much grief I got from uh, people in my own neighborhood, which was not exactly an elite neighborhood by any means. And, uh, you know, people said, you know, these people wanna burn their houses down, we shouldn't be helping them, that kind of thing. And it was just, you know, it was such a shock for me. And here I'm a St. Albans boy, I'm a choir, you know, I'm an acolyte in the theater or a choir still then I think. And so I, I, I sort of treated it as a gift given that you would reach out and help people who found bad fortune, but, uh, but that wasn't very universal. So, so anyway, I um, inspired by that, inspired by much of the uh, street ministry during the 60s, uh, during that time, I was, after I got out of divinity school, I said, let's do this in West Point Gray. So of course, the response of uh, several of the churches, we did an alliance of churches uh, in the West Point Gray Anglican churches, and, uh, and the response of them is, uh, there are no homeless people in West Point Gray. And, uh, and of course, uh, that is objectively untrue, but we were, uh, uh, we were bolstered by the homelessness count and, and Judy Graves, who was the homeless advocate down at City Hall, who was just a complete hero to us and helped us in many, many ways. And indeed, there are a large number of homeless people living in West Point Gray, living in the woods, living in the beach, and so on. So we put this ministry together, and the idea, first of all, was to take parishioners from different churches and put them out on the street with care packages of socks and food and clothing. And we went through a whole process to determine what these bags should have in them because we wanted it to be helpful. And so we did a lot of interaction, a lot of what the, what the Canadian International Development Agency would call needs assessment, uh, where we would go down and have conversations with people on the street. You know, if somebody was gonna give you a, you know, a, 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 a bag of goods, what do you really need? And you know, socks. Is, is huge, you know, and those sorts of things. So we, we adjusted the bags and we handed them out. And, and you know, it was about a, a, a ministry of witness. It was about a ministry of doing things and being seen to do things. I don't think we mentioned uh, Christian theology probably even once while we're doing this. We just said, they would, often people would say, oh, here come the church people. But we never talked about the church. We talked about the people on the street. We sat down with them and had conversations with them. And, and that made just a huge difference. And then we added a, a, what we call the mobile care unit, which provided medical and social service references. Uh, and we did a cooperation with the medical school at UBC and the school of social work at UBC um, to provide medical care and, and, and uh, social service references for needy people. So we would set the mobile care unit up at basically at St. Augustine's in South Vancouver uh, and, and had an evening where people would come in and um, and, part to, and, and be able to uh, get access to those services. And that was really great. Then COVID came along and everything kind of went away, but the uh, street ministry has revived. Uh, I'm now retired. And uh, so I'm no longer uh, as directly involved as I used to be, um, but uh, it's, it's really quite a statement that even after the COVID closed down, the people in these parishes were eager to get back out there. And I have to say there are a number of examples. I'll just, I don't want to take too much time on this, but people said, what is the purpose of the exercise? And my response, and I sort of drafted all the documents. I mean, I, I basically created the program, but a lot of help, obviously, from people. But people would ask me, what, what's the purpose here? And I said, transformation. The purpose is transformation. And it's not simply transforming a person on the street by giving them clean socks and food, and most importantly, conversation and a sense that they matter to people. That is transformative. But it's also transforming the people in the parishes. Because let's face it, West Point Gray is not the downtown east side. And you know, I, I with the greatest respect uh, possible, I refer often to the Good Burgers of West Point Gray, which I think they ought to start a they ought to start a hamburger stand called the Good Burgers of West Point Gray. But nonetheless, the Good Burgers of West Point Gray often think there is no homeless problem, or if it's a homeless problem, it's not my problem, whatever. 
So what we used to do is that transformation of the parishioners in that regard was, was, was just miraculous. And so every year we would have a, a service commemorating the neighborhood ministry and we would invite people who had been involved in it to come down and talk about their experiences. And I, you know, I, I just can't tell you how many people came in and said, when Pittman first proposed the neighborhood ministry, we just thought he was out of his mind. We didn't think that there was any way this was gonna happen. Then we said, well, he's forcing it on us, so let's keep doing it. I didn't exactly force it on anybody, but anyway, I try to persuade people. And so they would bring, they would start with, I'm gonna bring juice boxes. So every Sunday, they bring a collection of juice boxes, put it in our neighborhood ministry collection plate. Then they said, you know what I wanna do? I wanna start packing those, uh, those bags that people, because we had indoor teams that were packing the bags and outdoor teams that were distributing. I wanna join an indoor team and pack up the bags. And they would do that. And they'd say, you know what, I'm gonna go, on one of those outdoor teams and actually, you know, and, and the experience was of people who would say, if they saw a homeless person on the street, they were uncomfortable and they would actually cross the street to avoid having to walk by them to after, you know, not that long in the neighborhood ministry program, they're up hugging those guys, you know, and that is transformation and that is transformation. So, so that's kind of what that was about. And it's such a testament to that, that it is continuing at the initiative of the members even after COVID forced everybody to hide for a while. Sure. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but we, we need to turn to questions soon, in the next couple of minutes, sure. Pittman. But of course, there's another dimension which I haven't um, be, uh, perhaps left enough time in your life, which is music. And maybe as we trans, tra, trans, transition into the questions, you could say a little bit more about music, which obviously is... I would, if I may put words, you know, as part of your spiritual understanding of life and also about the, the transformative nature of music itself um, in terms right. of its appeal well, to them. Well, thank you for that. I, uh, I was in the Washington Cathedral Choir, so uh, I yes. learned <laughs> a lot about music and uh, I, I'm nowhere near the musician that your, your average church organist is, I have to tell you, but, but I'm, you know, I, I have a great love for it. Uh, and, you know, many experiences from that. And I was just recounting to my uh, 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 daughter just yesterday, actually, the experience of, uh, so my choir went to, went to England in, in 1966 to be the choir in residence at Westminster Abbey. And I think it was the first choir in residence from, from abroad uh, or from the United States, at least in quite a long time, if ever, to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the, of the founding of Westminster Abbey. So we sang services there and we met all the people and whatnot. But one of the great experiences was the was going up to Coventry, because we sang at Coventry Cathedral. And, and, uh, you know, when you ride that road from from London up to Coventry, I don't know if there are probably many by now, but um, you come over this hill and you see the hulk of the burned out old Norman Cathedral. And you drive a little while longer and then rising, literally rising like a phoenix from the ashes, you see the beautiful new modern cathedral. And that is just a you know, that is a, <laughs> that's an incredible experience. So, so that choir uh, was, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, Ravi Shankar, you know, Cesar Chavez, I mean, uh, not, not, um, not Cesar Chavez, uh, uh, people that we met in the course of that uh, process. Well, then since then, of course, I played guitar and listened to the Grateful Dead. And one of my experiences with the Grateful Dead was a lot of Grateful Dead lyrics, uh, theme, um, if you will, really were evocative of the Christian gospel. So I wrote a book uh, a few years ago called The Gospel and the Grateful Dead. And uh, I was urged to do it by folks in the church because I'd given a couple of talks on it. I wrote a paper on it at DST uh, and so on. So, you know, I self-published this book and, and it actually was very well received and actually it's probably sold more copies than any of my academic books have. Um, but, uh, and, it, and it really plums those ideas of uh, Christian fellowship, spirituality, commitment to social justice. You know, there's a great Grateful Dead song called Wharf Rat. And, 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 and this encapsula encapsulates this mission, Book of James, Grateful Dead, Gospel of the Grateful Dead. There's a line in that uh, where it's, a, it's, about a, it's about a down and outer on the wharf of San Francisco. And um, the, the, the narrator, who Jerry, Jerry Garcia sings the song, but whoever the narrator is, says, uh, can I help you? And, and, uh, and uh, the person says, ask me if I got a dime, a dime for a cup of coffee. And the narrator's response is, I got no dime, but I got some time. 
Yeah. And this is so evocative of the neighborhood ministry. We did give things out, including money, but mainly it was to be a presence for people, to be, to be a conversation and a presence for people. And the great uh, former dean of uh, Christ Church Cathedral downtown, uh, Peter Elliott, used to use the phrase that in ministry, don't just do something, sit there. And that sitting there, I got no dime, but I got the time, is about committing ourselves to the humanity of the people that we are engaged with. And that was embedded in the, in the Grateful Dead, embedded in the Gospels. And so that's what led me to write that book. And of course, I played in a Grateful Dead band and you know, made music and made CDs and all that sort of thing. So music is a big part still. Well, I think we must now turn it over to everybody who's uh, been listening to your fascinating talk. So are there any questions? I've got my chat box open, but as yet, I haven't got uh, anybody who's typed in a question. Oh, can I ask a can... question? Yes, of course, Diana. Diana, uh, just one comment. First, Pittman always seems to me to have four, far more hours in the day than most of us <laughs> do. <clears throat> and another quick comment there's at the SOC comment. I was involved for a long while in giving out socks from the cathedral at Barad and um, Georgia for many people who came in for socks. And it always struck me that the reason we could give out so many socks is that they were all made in China and they were much, much cheaper than socks used to be in my time. But my question is about the collision between the Chinese concept of law and the common law in Hong Kong with the imposition of the uh, the the Guota Antrantra, the state security law, which um, appears to me to trump any other law that exists, and has been used in every conceivable way to crush any not just dissent, any kind of wearing of t-shirts with a, an unpopular slogan. Um, it's been enforced rigidly by a legal system, not necessarily the lawyers themselves, but certainly the police, uh, a civic had nothing to do whatsoever with common law, the tradition of Hong Kong. So I wondered if Pittman could say something about this um, really dreadful law, which has for the moment completely crushed Hong Kong. Uh, well, this is where the, the Jung part of Jung Fa is yes. supreme. <clears throat> So um, China has been systematically dismantling the, China, the Hong Kong legal system. They have dismantled the legal aid office. They have uh, stripped uh, lawyers who had even the slightest uh, involvement in uh, advising or representing uh, clients who had been uh, arrested um, often unlawfully for peacefully demonstrating. Uh, they have stripped them of their law licenses and in some cases detained them. Um, they have uh, put incredible pressure on the universities to, uh, to restrict uh, independent thought and discussion about the law, let alone about Chinese politics. So it is, an, uh, basically it's an unmitigated disaster for the law in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And what I find very interesting is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about China and Taiwan and what China might do and so on and so forth, but um, by its actions in Hong Kong, China has made it virtually impossible for any government in Taiwan to agree to merge with the mainland because they had an international treaty. I mean, this is another example of China disregarding international treaties, but the, the <laughs> sino British Declaration is an international treaty. It's registered with the UN International Treaty Database. It is a binding set of agreements. And China has just violated it without even, I mean, just completely violated it. So uh, it is uh, no, no country who, or no government in Taiwan is going to expect anything different. And so I don't see how they can possibly agree to really anything uh, in terms of merger with the PRC. And that means that the PRC has limited options. And I think that ultimately, maybe that's uh, maybe that means they won't be able to do anything. I don't know what it means, but but it's a uh, the situation in Hong Kong is great, which is why the, the law school inviting me to give a talk on exporting virtue was so remarkable. And several people uh, from there let me know afterwards uh, uh, by different channels, um, 
uh, how significant it was that I was able to give that talk. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is maybe they just didn't read the book. They just looked at the title and figured it was okay or something. But I, it, it was really quite remarkable. And it was, um, I mean, I was polite, but I didn't mince any words. I mean, I talked about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and I talked about the situation in Hong Kong and, and all the other things I talk about in that book. And uh, it was quite remarkable. But, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, the uh, repression against lawyers, judges. And I, I also think, though, that there's still the change from inside possibilities. And Madam, Justice, uh, Madam Chief Justice McLaughlin renewed her position on the corner of court of final appeal. And I think part of, I haven't spoken to her about it uh, recently, but but I, uh, I, I suspect that part of that is the idea that, look, if we all pick up our stakes and leave, we are, we are abandoning Hong Kong to its fate. Whereas if we, can, if we maintain our position in institutions, whether they be law schools or, or court of final appeal or whatever, we at least have a glimmer of a possibility of after the initial zeal of the takeover and the national security law and so on subside, we have the possibility of, out, of actually being able to affect uh, a better outcome, but it's uh, it's looking very bleak right now. Yeah, Thank you. can I turn to is Diana? Is it right if I bring in another question? Sure. Uh, this is from Nicola Hall. Why do you think China, in quotes, gave away and sent back the two Michaels so quickly? Um, right. Well, you know, uh, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, it was completely coincidental. Uh, co coincidental. Uh, the Chinese <laughs> official. <laughs> I have trouble saying that without laughing, but nonetheless, that is the official view. And in fact, um, that's uh, we've heard that from Canadian officials as well. So clearly, there is a there is a script where we have to avoid suggesting that China was pressured into doing that. Uh, we have to try to protect a fiction that the uh, taking of the two Michaels was a completely unrelated national security matter and was not hostage diplomacy. Now. I personally, I know a lot of people working in the China field. I don't know a single person who believes that, not even people who are spokespeople for China. So um, in fact, the answer of a distinguished colleague at UBC, when we had a, the, we had a seminar about this, the first uh, you know, week or so after the two Michaels were taken was China's angry and therefore they're justified. This is a UBC person. Uh, China's angry and therefore they're justified in doing this. I mean, I, I haven't run into a single person that didn't think it was hostage diplomacy. So why did they do it so quickly? You know, I, I, the, lot, the number of different reasons. I mean, they, they uh, and, and I don't really know them all, but, but I think part of it is, and we're starting to see this in domestic politics in China, that China needs, just as I said, we need China, China needs its relationship with the West. <laughs> I mean, the West is the uh, export target of for a big slice of the Chinese economy. If uh, if if um, Western country importers were uh, constrained from importing from China for human rights violation issues, Uyghur labor issues, or, or climate violations for that matter, uh, it would have a very bad impact on the Chinese economy. So so I think there are many people in the system that are saying. You know, enough is enough. We have there's not much more we're going to get from this, and the price we're paying is very high. And so uh, uh, I think that that is part of the calculus. But uh, uh, again, it all depends on who you talk to. But I, I think that they were um, they had a moment to remove a major irritant. And and you know the thing about Canada and China is so interesting that. You know, if you go to China, I mean, Canada just does not loom large. I think it's fair to say. I mean, they, you know, the responses you get, oh, it's really cold up there, or you know, whatever. I mean, they, it just doesn't loom large in 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 both Chinese people and the Chinese government's assessment of their global circumstances. But nonetheless, China knows very well that Canada is critical to them in terms of building good offices with Europe and with the United States. And Canada has a long history of pretty good relations with China, even at some pretty terrible times. So uh, I think that China values that. Now, they're not going to tell us they value that. They never tell you they value you, but they do. And I think that they needed a, an opportunity to remove a major irritant and to try to bring Canada a little, a little closer to the middle in terms of China's longstanding and big game conflict with the United States. So I think that's part of it, but I don't really know all the answers. Well, um, can I follow up with a very Other people in this question. audience probably do, actually. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to give you another question from Lynn Smith. What steps, which follows on, do you think the Canadian government should be taking with respect to relations with China, Pittman? Well, thank you very much for the question and for attending. Um, 
last fall, I was invited to contribute a paper to uh, the Canadian International Council uh, collection celebrating the 50th anniversary of normalization of relations with China. And uh, there were a number of papers in there by a number of distinguished people. And then there was my paper, which was about uh, governance and human rights. And what I said in that paper, I, I did list a number of, of, of policy suggestions. And, and, uh, and I also list a number of policy suggestions in the Exporting Virtue book, uh, one of which is, is considering Magnitsky sanctions against Chinese officials who are responsible for human rights violations in Xinjiang, for example, but not only in Xinjiang. So uh, that's something, it's, it's in our law. We can, you know, it's in our law and, and we should start thinking about that. But um, what I suggest in that paper, and it's still my view, is that we need to be orienting ourselves toward a more situational approach to China rather than a relational approach. For many years, and again, going back to the Hu Jintao visit and you know, about eight years ago, uh, where there was agreement on a, quote, strategic partnership, uh, both Canada and China have invested considerable political capital in creating you know, whether it's real or mythical doesn't actually even matter. It's part of the rhetoric and part of the discourse, a special relationship. And that helped explain in part uh, China's feelings of betrayal when Canada detained Meng Wanzhou in the, in the extradition matter and Canada's feelings of betrayal when China engaged in hostage diplomacy with the two Michaels. But I think that the, uh, what I suggest in that, in that uh, paper is that we should save our relational commitments for countries and regions like the EU, for example, or, or the United States, with whom we share some basic values. With China, we, fit, we, we share really almost nothing in terms of basic political values. With Chinese people, we share many human values, the importance of family, the importance of relationships. But with the Chinese government, we share very, very few. And, and so I think that we ought to be taking a situational approach rather than a relational approach. But of course, China wants to continue to be living in the relational world. That is what they want from us. And so they want us to assess every move we make on China in terms of what's it going to do to the relationship. And, and I think we need to kind of free ourselves from those constraints so that we're able to say, we will criticize you politely, but stir of uh, politely but robustly on genocide and uh, in Xinjiang we will criticize you robustly on detention of human rights lawyers Hong Kong and the other other things but we will also hold out a hand of potential cooperation and friendship on matters like infectious disease and pandemic uh, pandemic response and and climate change now I don't pretend for a second that that's easy because the Chinese have sort of officially said they don't want to do things that way but my experience in negotiations with China, over the years has been that, you know, they're pretty pragmatic and uh, they may say something that's important for making the, the, the sort of the TIFA, the, the, uh, the, the political statement, the summary of the, of the slogan that is going to dictate their behavior. But at the same time in implementation, they can be very, very practical. So I think we need to be equally pragmatic and practical and say, we have no interest in being drawn in to being appearing to uh, endorse the Chinese government's behavior, whether it be in Xinjiang or Tibet for that matter, or Hong Kong or Taiwan, we're not gonna endorse that behavior and we're not gonna be mum in our criticism. But at the same time, we are also very interested in sharing resources, exchanging scholars at the university level, exchanging officials at the, at the government level on things like climate change and pandemic, that will help China and that will help us. And I think in the long run, it may allow us to move forward. Another very interesting question from Hans Schutzer. What do you think about China's relationship with religion? Do you see the, any change compared to the time of Mao? Well, thanks for that question. And I, uh, I wrote about this uh, some years ago. In fact, my peripheries book that you mentioned uh, has a chapter on, on religion and society as uh, one of the indicators of Chinese policy toward minorities, which at the time was at the very last uh, uh, breaths of, a, of what was at the time an accommodation strategy, which was the idea of accommodating uh, minority nationalities and their religious uh, uh, convictions, uh, and to try to allow economic development to kind of uh, pacify people. Um, shortly after that book came out, that policy basically went away, and the and the policy on on minority nationalities is much more one of assimilation, and that's what we're seeing in Xinjiang, we're seeing it in Tibet, we're seeing it in Mongolia. Part of that is about religion where religion is no longer uh, given the scope that it was given under, say, Jiang Zemin, 
Um, so Jiang Zemin uh, talked about religion and 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 socialism coexisting, being you know sort of coexisting uh, with defined boundaries, but nonetheless coexisting. You do not hear that language from Xi Jinping these days. Uh, we you see religion as being essentially a threat to uh, the party's need to unify the society. So the government has been very active in the last several years in cracking down on churches and cracking down on religious groups and, and uh, cracking down on Tibetan monks and Xinjiang, closing mosques and imposing incredible draconian restrictions on practice of Islam, not only in Xinjiang, but Gansu and other areas. So uh, their view on religion is, is uh, not very uh, uh, supportive at the moment. And I, I call to mind a, a, a book that I, uh, referenced years ago and I wrote my article and a couple of articles and uh, on a book chapter on religion in China. And it was called Science and Dissent in China. I think Lyman Miller, uh, Alice Miller uh, was the author, I think if I remember correctly. And, uh, and basically it asked the question, why is it in the Soviet Union that it's the scientists who are at the forefront of political dissent? And that is because the scientists answer to a higher authority. They answer to scientific truth. They don't answer to the political wants of the regime. And this is something that the Trump faction in the United States has yet to learn. But with religion, it's the same thing. Religious people answer to a higher authority. And that is an inherent threat to the hegemony of the Chinese Communist Party and hence is being treated accordingly. Interesting. Well, Cedric Carter is asking, what do you think the Silk Road Initiative what effect it will have on China's understanding of other countries' uh, cultural and legal norms. Well, that's a, a terrific question and uh, an issue that I've, I've done, done some work on, in fact, in the, um, in the Exporting Virtue, uh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, in the Exporting Virtue book, there's a fairly lengthy segment on the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And, uh, and the human rights and implications of it. And, and frankly, they're not particularly good. I think China's practices and its uh, doctrines with regard to BRI are not particularly good. But what, what we want to remember is that China is not a monolith. China sends officials all over the world to help administer these programs. It sends its own workers all over the world to, to, to many carry out these programs. And those people are exposed to a reality which is often different from the reality that they're fed at home. And that conflict creates questions. And as those questions multiply, there is certainly the possibility that more and more people in China will start beginning to understand that life in other countries is not always as their own regime has portrayed it. And that tension between the regime truth and the on the ground truth, which is experienced in many societies, not just China, but it is really the key to building knowledge and ultimately the key to, to resisting uh, a government mandated uh, hegemonic ideology. So, so I think that uh, the Chinese regime's view, as indicated by its founding documents for BRI, for its lending documents on, on BRI projects, for its terms of uh, financing of road building and, and so on and so forth, do not uh, uh, pay much uh, attention there, much heed to local uh, cultural needs and so on. They leave that entirely to local donor uh, recipient uh, states. But at the same time, people in China, including intellectuals, including scholars, and this is evident in the writing. So if we look at uh, Chinese academic writing on the BRI, there's quite a lot of acknowledgement of the, you know, the, the tensions and the relationships between Chinese culture and local cultures and, and how mutual accommodation can work. Uh, there are many Chinese officials, some of from former graduate students from UBC who have spent field research time out on the BRI and have done uh, government projects on environment and so on in BRI countries and, and are, you know, uh, have developed a, a very uh, acute awareness of the importance of local uh, culture and values and so on. Um, and so I, I think there is the possibility of that kind of mixing and uh, of those ideas, but the regime's formal approach is not particularly accommodating. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't want to intrude again. Are there any other questions? I've, I've got one I might ask, but if there's somebody else who would like to ask another question, because you've had enough of me probably. Well, one fellow historian, I'll, I'll ask it if you'll all forgive me, um, has uh, likened uh, China to Bismarck's Germany. Should we understand um, China as following with all the change conditions in a path of a new form of imperialism or not? 
<clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> if I'm to start, I might as well say that at the beginning. I mean, I don't know Bismarck's Germany even remotely well enough to, but, but I guess part of the question in the formation of the Germany we know today has been the overcoming of regional rivalries and, and regional satrapies and so on. And, and Bismarck, I think, was part of that, but others were as well. And that was sort of the project of German nation building that is often, I think, associated with Bismarck and the domestic side. And I think China does fit that in a lot of ways. I mean, we think of China as you know, this large country, but, but you know, there are lots of differences and, and COVID is just one example of where local governments and the central government were not seeing eye to eye on various COVID uh, suppression uh, requirements. Uh, climate change is another one where local uh, uh, coal mining facilities, for example, are not happy at all with the notion of restricting coal in keeping with COP26 requirements. And so, you know, it is a very diverse and, and often very conflicted uh, polity. Uh, Xi Jinping's efforts to portray it as all uniform, uh, notwithstanding. So um, I think that uh, there is that element of it. But in terms of the international imperialist side, um, I, I just don't know. I mean, I think that there is certainly plenty of evidence to show that China wants to be the sole dominant power in Asia. Um, and I think it's also plenty of evidence to show that China wants, in addition to that, to be influential in the world, and, and the BRI, uh, Belt and Road, Silk Road Initiative is part of that. Um, I think it's also true that China wants to change the international institutional arrangement, what we in Canada call the rules-based international order, to suit its own interests. So they're certainly active, but in terms of an imperialist uh, uh, project, I um, I, I, I just I just don't know. I mean, I, I think that they don't want the burdens that come with imperialism. I mean, in classic imperialism, perhaps uh, the economic motivation was, of course, huge, but there was also a kind of a quote a civilizing element. Uh, pardon the expression, and and we see that in we saw it in Africa, we saw it in the Middle East, we saw it in mm -hmm. Canada, um, and and so I, I'm not sure that that plays much of a role in in Chinese thinking about it. Um, I, I, I haven't seen much evidence of that, um, and so I, I'm not sure that that plays such a role. So, so, but it, there's no doubt that in East Asia, they want to be the sole dominant power, which raises huge, very significant questions for Canada. And so we see Canada issuing a new Asia Pacific strategy, which they're now calling an Indo-Pacific strategy to align more closely with the United States. Uh, the relations with Japan are going to be absolutely critical in that period, uh, not to mention relations with Taiwan, Philippines, South China Sea, all those issues, because China definitely wants to be the dominant power. And the question is, what is going to be the result of that? And it's, uh, I, I'd say it's, it's, you know, we're in, it's dangerous times, but, uh, but I don't really know the answer. Mm. One last question from anybody. Well, I'll, I'll put one more thing in. I was fascinated when I was in Shanghai um, that there was not very much interest from the government, in fact, almost nil, in preserving any of the historic architecture and some very interesting, uh, more historic housing developments. You know, they're kind of group houses with streets and laneways, which I think were a brilliant solution. But most of that has been bulldozed away. So I don't know whether you had that sort of sense of a a strange forgetting of a, an incredible uh, a tradition. Well, Shanghai is a uh, Shanghai is a unique case because much of the uh, what we saw, what we see even today, I mean, on Huai Hai Lu, for example, and there is a you know there are a number of of targeted developments that are there to be her heritage kind of developments. Mm. But but remember, those are basically foreign colonial developments. I mean, those are mm. built by foreign colonialists in the late 19th century and mid 19th century. So, so most of, much of what we see in, in Shanghai as sort of traditional, uh, traditional is not yeah. actually Chinese traditional, it's foreign yeah. colonial. Um, but but the, uh, the question you raised is very apt because we've seen this dilemma in Beijing where Beijing, the classic uh, uh, courtyard house, the Suhu Yuan, mm -hmm. is, is basically been pretty much bulldozed out of existence yeah. except for a few selected uh, ones, uh, Song Qingling's mansion, for example, and a few others that have been left as national heritage sites. But uh, but by and large, they are the old laneways, the hutong, all in Beijing. Is much of it is gone in the wake of, of development. And I remember vividly uh, being in Beijing. This is I, I I can't go actually now, but um, being in Beijing. Uh, 
I had been gone for a while, I think maybe a year or so. And, and I was in a cab going across town and I knew where I was going and I knew where I was and so on. And I look up and I do not recognize the neighborhood. And the neighborhood I was in was a totally familiar neighborhood that I had bicycled around countless times. And I looked up and I looked around and I said, I asked the driver, where, where are we? You know, Hong Dong. Oh, really? I didn't realize Hong Dong looked like this. So, or, or uh, uh, Dung Dako actually. So um, uh, I was, uh, I was, um, mindful of that. So in Beijing, it has been a big issue. You know, to me, almost worse, to be honest, almost worse is the kind of hackneyed restoring of old houses, where if we look at the restoring of the Gugung, for example, the Palace Museum, um, they, uh, it, it's really, um, it's a travesty in terms of the art that was in the original, uh, not to mention the color of the walls. Uh, the red that they're using is a Communist Party red. It's not a it's not an imperial vermilion. Um, and, and that has happened in Prince Kung's, the restore, restoration of Prince Kung's mansion uh, north, of, uh, uh, north of Gugong and many other sites which were restored to gain foreign tourism dollars. And the foreign tourists don't know really the difference one way or the other. So as long as it looked kind of Chinese and old, uh, the, 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 the matter was accomplished. And I'm not the person that knows enough about Chinese architecture or restoration techniques to say, I'm basically repeating what numerous Chinese uh, uh, professors who, whose life work was Chinese traditional architecture and city planning uh, shared with me, so. This was marvelous. Well, Pittman, I'm afraid we're getting pretty close to the end. Um, I don't think that I can do a wrap up of all we've talked about. I think it would be unfair to the richness of your experience and the diversity of your thought and insight. But perhaps I could bring it to a close by saying that you do have, I think it's going to be published, what to me is a fascinating book, Fever Dreams, um, coming out soon, which is full of meditations crossing many cultural boundaries, but about trying to understand things in a deeper way. Um, maybe you could just quickly tell us when that's going to be coming out. Well, thank you for that. And, and this was, um, you know, sometimes when I write, I'm never sure whether I'm whether it's scholarship or therapy, to be quite honest with you. So, uh, <laughs> um, and maybe a little bit of both, but this was, uh, I started that project in about April of 2020. And, uh, you know, I was, it was depressing. I mean, you know, we were in under lockdown. We didn't know how long it was going to go. And and then really out of the blue, I mean, really divine inspiration, I, I must say, um, I got the idea to put together a book of meditation that would be uh, a, a multi-dimensional and, and so on. It would combine photographs. So I take photographs. Those of, on the Emeritus photo group know how bad a pho pho photographer I am, but nonetheless, uh, I put some photographs together. And um, and I took uh, quotations from spiritual traditions of the Judeo-Christian tradition, Islam, uh, Buddhism, uh, Hindu, uh, uh, Taoism, and, uh, and uh, Buddhism, I think, I, there were six. And, uh, and I put these quotes um, and then I paired them up with photos and I left it as an, as an offering for how do we work our way through COVID? Because what I got so tired of when I was hearing last April, and this goes back to the inequality point you were mentioning. I get very tired of, of people complaining about COVID and saying, I wanna get back to normal because whatever it was that was in the world before COVID was by no means normal. I mean, the inequalities, the oppression, they, you know, they, were, they were all there. And I have no interest in recreating that, rebuilding that, or even endorsing its rebuilding. So I think the task of all of us, all of us, coming out of COVID is how do we build a new world? How do we build a new world that has the equality, that has the fairness, and then allows us to deal with pandemic response, uh, 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 climate change and, and re refugee migration and a host of other issues in a more equitable and effective way. And my conclusion was, we can only really do that if we go inside ourselves. The problem is the solution is not out there. The solution is in here. And, and so in order to find that solution, we have to go into ourselves and say, what do we as people, who are we? What do we think? What do we want? And this book of meditations was designed to do that. So uh, it was a terrific experience for me. It took me better part of 220. I, I, I 
prepared it and printed it all out. And it's, it's being circulated among the churches as a fundraiser for the neighborhood ministry. Um, I frankly speaking, having thought about, have not thought about taking it to a, a, a regular publisher. Um, certainly I could, I, 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 I should think about that, but I, I hadn't. But the idea of, about initially was to put this uh, book together and, and, and to print it. And we've gone through about 250 copies so far uh, to uh, neighborhood ministry um, uh, people. And so we've been, you know, pretty fortunate in the number that have been uh, uh, ordered and and uh, enjoyed by folks in the whole variety of Anglican communities and other communities uh, around uh, around Vancouver. And I, uh, it was really a labor of love for me, and I appreciate you mentioning it. Well, I look forward to to, to getting a, a yes, you have copy and coming. supporting the ministry. Well, look, I really want to thank you, Pittman. Can I also thank um, Sandra and Christina for making this such yeah. a wonderful event and perhaps um, encourage all of you uh, to join us again on the 11th of January with Anne Gorsuch. And since I know it's a bit early, but so what? Can I wish you all season's greetings and a very happy new year. And thank you so much for being part of this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very for, for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it.